You are listening to the Ready PDM Network. Hello, Ready Product Radio heads, and welcome to another exciting episode of Ready Product Radio. This week features interview number two in our Entrepreneur's Journey series with friend and serial entrepreneur Eli Alston. If you haven't listened to episode 11, where we introduced Eli and his series, you may want to go back and do so before listening to this episode. This episode is sponsored by Under 10 Consulting. Get a product playbook custom tailored for your organization. As usual, we kick off the episode with a couple of sound bites to introduce the topics we will be covering. Ready Product Principle number 21 is inspired by Eli's journey. Sometimes you're ahead of your customers and sometimes they are ahead of you. Innovators, whether product people or entrepreneurs, must balance early adopter feedback, a.k.a. rejection, against cognitive dissonance, a.k.a. denial. Enjoy the show. Are you ready? An early adopter or lighthouse customer is an early customer of a given company, product, or technology. In politics, fashion, art, and other fields, this person would be referred to as a trendsetter. The term originates from Everett M. Rogers' diffusion of innovations. Typically this will be a customer who, in addition to using the vendor's product or technology, will also provide considerable and candid feedback to help the vendor refine its future product releases, as well as the associated means of distribution. How do you reach enough people so that you can get enough early adopters of your product? Now, every... Everybody listening to this podcast is probably familiar with one way or another with the you know, technology adoption life cycle and the idea of you know, technology enthusiasts and early adopters and the you know, major, the majority mm-hmm. and the you know, late majority and the laggards and whatnot. Yep. Um, so if you look at that, interestingly, uh, there's only a small percentage that you would consider early adopters. It's not that absolutely nobody would buy that product. Actually, we had certain people who were willing to pay us money for a product that basically didn't do anything. And you got to ask, well, who are those people and what's wrong with them? (laughs) That's a true early adopter. Those are people who were buying from us, not the product as it existed at that time, but the vision of the product that we thought it would be. This was a customer that wasn't going to go to this retailer, wasn't even going to visit them, Mm. because they had a friend who had a poor experience some years back. So they saw this saw the um, our button on the mm-hmm. retailer's website. They clicked on it, started having a conversation, had a good 20-minute conversation with one of the sales reps. The next weekend, they came in and bought a you know seven to $9,000 kitchen package. Talking to people is just really hard because the first time you hear somebody who says, no, I think that's the world's stupidest idea, you kind of, ah, oh, they just don't get it. The problem is, is if you're the founder... You can't ignore about 10 or 15 of those in a row and cognitive dissonance starts setting in and smoke starts coming out of your ears because people you're explaining to like are going, no, I think it's a dumb idea. And one or two th- things are actually the case is either they truly don't get it and you are building something they haven't seen yet because you're in a new market, or if you're in an existing market, you don't get it and they're trying to teach you something that you might want to pay attention to. And you have a lot of people browsing online for products and searching, and you mess up once in that process with them, and they're going to just go to the competitor's site, and that competitor's site is not, you know, a 15-minute drive away. It's a five-second click away. Eli Alston, welcome back to Ready Product Radio. If I recall, we first spoke back in episode 11, uh, but for folks who uh, might not have heard that episode yet and uh, meeting you for the first time, so to speak, uh, why don't we start with you giving a, a reintroduction of yourself, please? Excellent. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Um, I'm the co-founder and president of Store Home Technologies, and uh, we're a small startup, and what we're working on is the ability for retailers to do live video conferencing with their shoppers. So basically, imagine you're sitting at home and you want to buy a dishwasher. You don't have to go into the store anymore. You can just go onto the retailer's website, click a button, and start having a face-to-face video conversation with a sales rep, who then can also walk you around the showroom floor, demonstrate products, all that great stuff without you ever having to leave your house. Sounds excellent. Uh, shopping for uh, big ticket items in your pajamas sounds like sounds like a good win for the the current climate. So, uh, for folks who didn't listen to our episode eleven, basically Eli and I are friends, 
And um, what I wanted to do was I asked Eli, I said, could we check in roughly every quarter and basically have a thread that runs through Ready Product Radio where we're uh, following the journey of, uh, of the entrepreneur. And I thought that would be interesting because uh, um, I know there's a lot, uh, in addition to product managers, probably a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, one-person shows, et cetera, that listen to uh, the podcast. So, um, Eli, why don't we start? We, we ended our last episode, if I recall, by I asked you to uh, pick two goals or two metrics um, that, we could, uh, that we could follow up on when we got back together. So uh, why don't we start with you uh, reiterating for us what those two goals were and, uh, and how you made out in the, in the previous uh, three months or so. Sure. The, uh, the first goal we had that I had stated during our last podcast was that I wanted to go out and talk to a lot of prospective customers. Um, if you recall, Alan, we were at a stage where we had uh, taken a lot of risk by focusing on our initial lead customer, doing some development work for them. And when we attempted to do a rollout with them, we had uh, you know some bumps along the way because of how we were, you know, how the product was being used. So we took that opportunity after those bumps to regroup and think about, okay, what are our next de- steps going to be? How are we going to, you know, in- ensure the next role that we do is a lot more successful. And one of the strategies we had for that was to go out and get a better understanding of the marketplace, something we should have done earlier, um, but uh, circumstances didn't align to allow that to happen. So yeah, so our goal was to talk to 25 different customers. Uh, We exceeded that. I think we had over about four or five weeks, we probably talked to about 35 um, customers. We did a uh, basically a walking tour. We just drove up to as many Um, small retailers were focusing on retailers with one to three stores going in talking to the owners talking to the managers and just trying to get uh, quick conversations with them about what they thought about the product Um, I think it was really successful because it as with anything the more you learn about something the more Mm -hmm. different perspectives you hear about it then you start recognizing patterns Mm -hmm. and you're able to see how your product can be useful for them you know the what the value proposition is for certain types of retailers and not for others and so forth. Did you, just a follow-up question on that, Eli, did you, do you record those interviews or do you just take paper notes or what, uh, what kind of, what, how are you capturing that intel? Um, the strategy was, um, let's just try and get a five minute conversation. Mm-hmm. So what we wanted to do very basically was just understand how valuable our idea was to a certain type of retailer. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to we had to go into it with a uh, an open mind though um, it's a numbers game meaning that we have to talk to a lot of customers mm-hmm. to get to get the right types of feedback so we couldn't be discouraged mm-hmm. so the goal was how many five minute conversations can we have mm-hmm. and the good five minute conversations led to um, usually a um, an acceptance of us coming in and providing a demonstration for them. So mm-hmm. we got a few demos out of it as well nice. too, which then leads to them being a much more qualified prospect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there was, didn't need to record it. Um, audit, um, with audio, we just, uh, we took some notes, you know, compiled some stats about, you know, the general level mm-hmm. of what we did. The stats were, were around how excited they were for the product. Mm-hmm. You know, did it have an immediate need and benefit for them? Mm-hmm. Um, the other stat was around, were they a decision maker in the organization? So were we talking to the right person? Mm-hmm. And then another stat was around, um, you know, kind of how much they would pay for that, how much mm-hmm. value they saw in it. Mm-hmm. So really good first level information. Yeah, excellent. So sounds like you knocked that one out of, out of the park. Uh, so what was your second goal then that you were aiming for last, last time we spoke? A second goal was for us to to take that um, that rollout that we did last year and improve upon that. And we did that. We have a lead customer um, who has a multi-store operation. And we rolled out again, we'll call it rollout version two, at the end of January. And since then, we've been um, improving and improving and improving upon the process. And they're still using it now. We're up to, uh, we're getting a, I guess right now daily, it's kind of an average out about a, uh, a half to one call a day mm. um, that comes through on the system for them, so they're they're happy about that. Uh, and we've we had a couple of really great successes. Um, for example, we had one one customer who phoned in to buy some appliances 
well, phone isn't the right word, sorry about that, uh, called in using our video chat. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they, um, this was a customer that wasn't going to go to this retailer, wasn't even going to visit them mm. because they had a friend who had a poor experience some years back. Oh. So they saw this, saw the, um, our button on mm-hmm. the retailer's website. They clicked on it, started having a conversation, had a good 20 minute conversation with one of the sales reps. The next weekend they came in and bought a, you know, seven to $9,000 kitchen package. Nice. Nice. And this is from a customer that would not have come into the store at all. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Which really probably, uh, enhances your, your value proposition. Cause that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, probably the ones that you want to attract. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, going back to that goal that we had, the goal was for us to, to implement, to roll it out with this lead customer so that we could understand what the return on investment was. Mm-hmm. Um, if you recall, selling this way to consumers using video chat for kind of larger ticket items is something that's not really done. So there's you can't just go look it up and see what your next competitor is doing in terms of conversion rates and how much value they're providing to customers. Mm-hmm. So as a startup, one of the big risks that we have is that we're not going to provide enough value to our customers mm-hmm. to charge enough money for us to be profitable. Mm-hmm. So us figuring out what the ROI is, whether that's you know, a lot of ROI or not a lot of ROI is extremely important. Mm-hmm. Good, good. So, so success there. And, and just to, just to reiterate kind of on, on the value proposition that you're trying to provide there. So I know I was a little bit confused, for example, uh, years ago when Amazon expanded from books and started selling, you know, things like big screen TVs and, and, you know, 10, you know, multi-thousand dollar items. Uh, but then we all kind of realized that, okay, here's the scenario. Uh, Best Buy is basically operating as a showroom for Amazon. A customer would go to a Best Buy type uh, organization, look at the product, um, turn it on, play with it. And then if they liked it, then go back home in their pajamas and, and hit the buy now button on uh, on, on Amazon. So uh, it, it, what you're offering is kind of a, an interesting thing, which is to say, you don't even have to go down and, and do your best buy uh preview uh shopping you you know you could do that online as well so you know exceeding in some ways the amazon experience is that fair uh yeah that's 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 definitely fair Uh, one of the uh, one of the common misconceptions about you know e-commerce and selling products online is that it's an all or nothing equation Mm -hmm. where Either you're a company that only sells online or you're a company that only sells in bricks and mortar stores. Right. Um, the reality that's emerged, especially over the last couple of years, is a concept of a hybrid model where most existing bricks and mortar retailers who are moving to online are keeping the majority of their stores mm-hmm. and they're operating in a model called omni omni channel. Yep, yep. Which I've is heard, the heard that term, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is the not channel from a supply side but channel from a consumer choice side the consumer can use any number of purchasing channels Mm -hmm. to research to review to complete the transaction with a retailer Mm -hmm. so what you're finding now is that best buy will stay in business because people will want to go and touch and feel products Mm -hmm. and see products um, and have a talk to a real person Mm -hmm. so what we're trying to do is we're trying to in some cases, cut out the middleman for that and allow mm-hmm. them to go direct to the retailer without having to get into their car. Mm-hmm. So they're still getting an in-store experience, but mm-hmm. they're not having to, as you say, you know, get changed. Especially if you have mm-hmm. kids or there's a yep. snowstorm or you know the only sh- the showroom you want to go to is the other side of town. Yeah, um, there's no point in it. Yeah, and, and something that occurred to me just as you were talking there is is uh, rural type environments, right, where where you don't. Um, you and I both live in, in a, I would call suburbia type yes. environments. So, so I imagine we can both within five minutes get to a Best Buy or get to a furniture warehouse or whatever. But another category I just thought of as you were talking there is, yeah, what if, what if you're more remote? I have an aunt that lives in a, in a very small town in New Brunswick, for example, um, and it's it's a day trip probably for her to say, okay, I'm going to go to Moncton, I'll do some shopping, I'll stay overnight, right, yes. uh, and then come back home the next day. Uh, so so this is a, a great market for for your uh, solution as well. And interestingly, Canada actually has a very high urban population mm. um in fact it, they 
generally Canada is considered more urbanized than the United States. Mm. And um, because of that, of course, you, know, right. you have the opportunity, you have a lot of people who live around city areas who, you know, there isn't, there aren't big stores yep. nearby yep. and there's lots of traffic. Yeah. And anybody that lives in Toronto can attest to this. If you live in Toronto proper, yeah. getting around is a pain any time of day, any day a week. Yeah. So how do you how do you go to three or four stores to mm-hmm. sh- price compare, to look at different uh, you know, showroom items and whatnot without spending an entire weekend doing it? If yeah. that's not what you're looking for. So. Yeah, that, that that's a good point. So the five minutes that you and I can can be to the Best Buy or the furniture warehouse, you're not even getting started if you're in an urban environment to to, to get somewhere, let alone like you say, two or three places. Yeah. So and then add in the the uh, the generational change that's happening with the millennial generation, where mm-hmm. you know the the amount of millennials that have cars in their twenties is much lower than <laughs> other generations. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're living in you know more urbanized, more uh, densified areas. Yep. And, you know, there's there's not, you know, you go to downtown, there's not a lot of big appliance or furniture stores in downtown. There might be smaller boutique ones, but you got to do a lot of traveling to, to get a yeah. good, good uh, browsing. Yeah, yeah, good point. And as a, as a father of a 20-year-old daughter who um, has me on a regular daddy taxi schedule, I can yes. attest to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, when I was younger, we, you know, it was one of the things we just couldn't wait to get our driver's license. But you're right, that, that, that demographic, uh, psychographic's changing. So that's, uh, that, 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 that's good. So basically did well on, on the two goals. So uh, we'll save it for the end of this interview. But I think uh, we should try to kind of raise the bar for next time, obviously, uh, was a little too easy for you this time, I think, um, to hit those hit those markers. Maybe <laughs> it was it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, but we achieved it. So that's good. It. <laughs> good, good stuff. So, so let's let's talk about what you're doing now. Uh, uh, you know, as we go through this, don't give away any secret sauce uh, to your competition or anything. But uh, the other couple topics that we thought we'd cover is is one converting early adopters and and how you manage the energy that you're investing in that. And then a second one, um, how do you drive usage with lead customers and, and more importantly, encourage their end consumers, who's the, the people at home sitting at home in their pajamas, to click that to click that button on their website? So why don't we start with the first one? So uh, you've been doing well, got an anchor, what I tend to call an anchor customer, good first customer. Um, so talk talk to me about, you know, what you've been doing in terms of converting some of those early adopters and, and how much energy that requires and, and how you balance that with other demands of the business. Yeah, the, the challenge with, with startups, especially most specifically with startups that have to rely on a direct selling model to get going, um, is how do you reach enough people so that you can get enough early adopters of your product. Now, every, everybody listening to this podcast is probably familiar with one way or another with the you know, technology adoption life cycle and the idea of you know, technology enthusiasts and early adopters and the, you know, major, the majority mm-hmm. and the you know, late majority and the laggards and whatnot. Yep. Um, so if you look at that, interestingly, uh, there's only a small percentage that you would consider early adopters. And a small percentage of those kind of evangelists and early adopters are your target because at this point, at least in our company, we don't have proven results. We don't have a perfect product with all the features. Mm-hmm. We don't have a you know stable of case studies we can bring out. So mm-hmm. really what you're looking for people that ha- that share the vision that you have and people that are willing to take some risk. So by definition, there's only a percentage of the population of prospects out there that fit that uh, description. Mm-hmm. So let's say it's 5%. I can't remember the exact numbers at the moment, but let's say it's 5% fit that, that category. That means you have to talk to 100 customers, prospects, just to get five prospects mm-hmm. that are in your category. Mm-hmm. Now, those five prospects may not even be ready to buy. They might mm-hmm. not be in the right buying cycle. Mm-hmm. You know, the you know the owner might be away for for a month or something. You yeah. know, there's all these other things that come into it. So what you have to do is really try and talk to as many people as you can and hit as many people as you can in the early days to try and get those early adopters. Yep. So what uh, what we've come in uh, what we've 
focused on is really trying to get as many conversations. And that goes back to what we're talking about around the five minute conversations. We found a really great tactic was to introduce yourself as a local entrepreneur who mm -hmm. just wants some feedback on an idea. Mm -hmm. Generally, anybody in any senior level in a business is going to give you five minutes mm -hmm. if you're nice enough. And especially if you try hard enough. Yep. Um, I would say my the average number of times I have to contact somebody to get even five minutes is three. Mm. You know, whether it be three phone calls and voicemails or yep. three emails or some combination of those things. Everybody's busy. Everybody's busy. And, you know, that's just the how hard you have to work to get that. So, so we found that you got to be very determined and you have to be very persistent with it. Um, don't give up. But then you also have to recognize that it's only a five minute conversation and you can't spend too much time looking for people. So you have wow. to, on the other side of the scales, if you're spectrum, you have, if you're spending six or seven touches for somebody, it's too much. Mm. So there's some really great techniques we've been using. Uh, once we get to the fourth touch, we kind of send what we call, you know, as a breakup email. We say, look, we've tried to get a hold of you. We really want to talk to you. If you're interested, please contact us back. If not, we'll keep you, you know, we'll try and contact you later, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but at that point, as long as you make your intention known to them that you're not going to be phoning them anymore, then at least you've set that expectation that they, you know, they've, they've got to do something about it if they want to have the conversation. And, you know, that sometimes works. You know, mm -hmm. we've had a couple of people that will get back to us and go, oh, wait, sorry, I was just really busy. You know, thanks so much for letting me know. Yes, I can do five minutes, mm -hmm. whatever. So that's been an effective technique. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we found is really tough with new prospects is figuring out how you're going to do pricing. We've talked to, um, I, I've talked to a few entrepreneurs about this in the past and people can really get bogged down on what the pricing needs to be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my experience has been, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. uh, don't underprice yourself. Um, obviously if you've got a, you know, if you've got certain costs and things like that, I mean, you don't want to give it away. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you give it away, you're not, you're not getting any feedback on whether somebody would, is willing to pay for your product. And that's right. really important. You need to figure out if somebody's going to give you money, they're going to sign a contract and give you money, whether it be monthly or one time that, that transacting of dollars is a really important, significant emotional step for your customer. Mm -hmm. So if nobody's willing to do that for you, then that's, that's a signal to you that maybe you're off on your value proposition. So what my recommendation to people is, you know, for pricing is, Get something in the ballpark, but don't be afraid to change it customer to customer for the first few customers. Mm -hmm. After you get five or six customers, you'll figure out where the middle road is and what makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but don't tr don't over optimize it. Don't spreadsheet it all to heck mm -hmm. and spend your life trying to figure out you know what the you know how to get the perfect yep. you know profit margin and stuff like that because too many things will change. You have no over control over stuff, and most importantly, what's more important than having perfect profit, perfect pricing, is to have those early customers. Because you're going to learn so much from them. That's yeah. worth much more than an extra $20 a month mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that, 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 that's good stuff. So, so, um, are you are, like, let's go back to the energy, to the energy yeah. aspect of that. So, so you, you've got that one anchor first kind of customer. Um, you're, you're, you're doing this other, you know, you're still trying to find other early adopters, can you give us a sense of, of, of how much energy is going into uh, continuing to develop that anchor customer and uh, versus some other uh, early adopters? Or what I'm trying to do is is adjust my energy to be almost eighty percent market prospecting and twenty percent um, existing customer. Mm -hmm. Um, now I have a business partner who who works more on the engineering technology side of things, mm -hmm. and so I expect him to you know to take up some of the slack for me on that. Yep. Um, but definitely, spending too much time with the anchor customer is also bad mm -hmm. because it's very easy to develop something for them that works, mm -hmm. but isn't saleable to anybody else. Mm -hmm. So you gotta you gotta force yourself to go out there and find those new customers before your product's ready, before you know the answers. Go out there get other people interested in it mm -hmm. and that's the only way you're going to move it forward mm -hmm. yeah. so so let's talk a little bit about because your your approach may have evolved maybe it hasn't but let's let's touch on how you go about 
you know, finding those. So you, so you're saying how many touch points are, are, are you, are, is it always in person? Are you leveraging tools like LinkedIn or, or, or your network? How, like, how do you, have you, have you found what the, what the best kind of, I guess, physical path is to connect with these people? Is it, is it electronic? Is it, is it, uh, you know, uh, physical? Is it a combination of the both or? Um, if I, if, if I had to grade them, so, yeah. so a caveat with this is that we're still trying to figure out what our business model is. Um, yeah. Once we figure out what our value proposition is, then we're going to, um, or at least how, how much money somebody's willing to pay for a value proposition, right. then we're going to really figure out if, if our model supports direct sales at all, if it has to be yeah. all uh, self-service online. But um, it, so for the time being, we're just trying to talk to people. And the best way that we found to talk to people, one, the first one that's the best is an introduction. If you can get an introduction from somebody that knows somebody, mm-hmm. your your chances of actually having that conversation are Ooh. significantly higher. Yeah, no You're doubt. Going from cold to warm, at least. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this. So then, once you go from, like you said, if you're all out of warm leads and you go to the cold leads, um, there's there's a variety of techniques that I find that are useful. Um, I think the the most successful, but probably the but the most time consuming is going in on foot, walking into a retail operation mm-hmm. and having and trying to talk to. This episode is brought to you by Under 10 Consulting. For many organizations, it seems products get released by individual heroics. Yet most organizations need a small number of living documents, fewer than 10, to manage their products and services. Contact Under 10 for a product playbook designed specifically for your organization. Uh, the owner. Now, for retail operations, this works because retailers small retailers that are owner operated are customer facing and you can get in and talk to them Mm -hmm. for other types of businesses where the president is unavailable to just somebody who walks up and there's too many gatekeepers then it's not worth the effort Mm -hmm. so in retail i found that's pretty effective for smaller businesses Mm -hmm. Um, but as soon as you get three or four store sized retailers you know, larger retail, medium to larger retailers, there's no way you can do that. Because mm-hmm. now you're going and talking to store managers instead of the general manager or whatnot, and you start getting further and further from your target audience. Mm-hmm. You really want somebody who has the purchasing power and who has the power to to invest in new projects to be able to tell you whether it's a good idea or not. Mm-hmm. Um, in summary, though, you'll have to make that trade-off between is it worth your time mm-hmm. to go and do those personal interactions versus um, you know, being able to be a little more efficient with your time by doing telephone cold calls, which mm-hmm. still work. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're good on the, f- you don't even have to be good on the phone, it's just really a persistence thing. Just need to phone up people, not be afraid of phoning, um, talk to them, whatever tactic you can to get a few minutes of their time, get mm-hmm. them talking. If they're interested, they'll keep on talking. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's kind of the same old rules for, for, for cold calling have always kind of existed. Mm-hmm. Um, the one recommendation I would give you is that people are so have been burnt so many times by by traditional sales techniques over cold calling mm-hmm. that they're very sensitive to it. So the more authentic and honest you can be, mm-hmm. um, the more success you'll have. That's why our strategy about of s- upfront clearly stating that we're local entrepreneurs yep. really is effective. Yep. If we had tried some of the more slicker cold calling mm-hmm. techniques of, yep. you know, trying to force them to into a meeting by getting, yep. giving them two times and all these other types of things. Um, I mean, that, that can be useful, I suppose, if you're dealing with uh, in some situations, but in our situation for the type of high level conversation we want to have and the type of feedback we wanted to get, mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't a good tactic for us. Yeah. Good. Good. Excellent. So, so um, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about the, the second one then. So, you said another challenge that that you guys are focused on right now is driving usage of the of the product, and specifically, uh, there's two aspects for your product. There's usage by the by your customer staff, so in the store. Uh, there's one element there, and then there's usage uh, by the end consumer sitting at home in their pajamas on your customer's website. And maybe again, just because uh, people might not have listened to our first conversation, maybe in answering this, just reiterate 
kind of verbally the, if you will, the architecture of your product, because there's a component that's used in the store, and then there's a component that's uh, on the on the company's website as well. So yeah, maybe just start reiterate that for folks that didn't listen to episode sure. eleven. Sure, and that, that and this question is actually really hits in on traditional product management. Right. Um, so it'd be interesting to explore it. Um, so our product offering includes kind of two components. One component is for the actual retailer, and it's a a stand and video camera that the sales associates use to send video from the store to consumers who are at home. The second component of our offering is the um, a, is the ability for consumers to be able to click a button on the retailer's website to and start a video chat. And we've got a, we support a couple different platforms. We support doing this through uh, through the web, so you can use Internet Explorer, Chrome. Um, Safari and most of all the um, browsers to start the video chat right from your desktop or laptop computer. We also have an iOS and Android app that's that are on the um, on the Play Store and App Store that consumers can download as part of the process. So the the challenge for us has been how do you get how do you get a consumer's attention while they're researching and browsing for product and convey to them the um, the benefit that this new channel of of sales um, can have to them. Mm-hmm. So this is this is a real classic problem about how to educate the market on on the value of what you're providing. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people, what we've let me back up one sec. What we've done is we've taken an approach that's very similar to live text chat. And for those who don't know what that is, that's that little box that pops up on your web on a website when you want to just have a a quick text chat with a customer service rep for any number of uh, you know mm-hmm. any number of business uses. It's very popular. So we've done a similar sort of thing where we have a box that pops up, a couple images, you know, nice headline, call to action on it. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of but instead of having just text chat, you click the button and it starts a video conversation. Okay. So you can imagine you're shopping for something like appliances. You're on an appliance retailer website. This box pops up. And you look at it and you go, live video chat. Okay, well, I'm a consumer and I know what video chat is because I know what Skype is. I know what FaceTime is. Mm -hmm. But why would I want to use that for buying an appliance? Mm -hmm. So this is the big big chasm that we have to cross with consumers is is trying to communicate to them very, very succinctly Mm -hmm. that, yeah, you want to use this tool because you're going to have better conversations with people. You're going to be able to see products that you can't see just by looking at the product catalog online. Mm-hmm. You'll be able to see features in a new way. And overall, your experience is going to be significantly better than not using this. But of course, all those things are very difficult to communicate in the seconds of attention mm-hmm. that somebody has on a website. And a question for clarification, Eli. So, because the immediate thought that came to my mind is, so when you say video chat, obviously there's value. You want to show, the retail wants to show me the product, but I could see the other fear of an end consumer being, um, I just, you know, I've got a, a facial on here. I just, uh, you know, my hair is a mess. I'm in my pajamas. So is it, is it, is it uh, does it default to also the retailer seeing me through my web camera, or is it only me seeing the the product um, of the retailer? Well, like, is it is it both ways? Well, that was an early learning for us. <laughs> okay, uh, what, way back when was that? Um, we always start the conversation with the consumer's camera turned off. Awesome, and we yeah. make that very clear. Good, good. Um, that must help a lot. That must help a lot because yep. that's a lot of the fears is mm, I'm not sure I don't want to, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And anything that indicates that a camera is going to be used, it tends to turn people off yep. from this. Um, you know, that'll change over time as people mm-hmm. get a little more comfortable with video conversing. Um, but I mean, this is privacy and, you know, people are at home and yep. I mean, there's a, any number of reasons why it's not appropriate for that. Yep. So that was, you know, that was definitely a learning. Um, also, focusing a lot on how to eliminate the number of steps required to start the video chat. So we, we have this kind of, there's a constant conflict with one wanting to capture information Mm -hmm. about the, about the consumers, but also knowing that the more information we ask for, the less likely they're going to continue in the process. Right. So we've been paring down that process. 
Um, we've been working on more innovative ways to to launch the video chat without it seeming like it's coming from another company. So you want it to be, you want people to feel safe Agreed. and feel like it's coming from the retailer's website, not yep. from a different rep website. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's probably about you know a dozen really key learnings that we came out of this mm-hmm. with. Um, I would say the the big thing that's really important to understand here is that from a product management perspective, none of this would be possible if we didn't have really good logging. Mm-hmm. And um, so what we've done is from the beginning, we made sure that everything that we built, there was a significant amount of event logging occurring for us so that we could track down and understand the behavior. Mm-hmm. As anybody that runs an e-commerce website will understand is that one of the big challenges with, with selling to customers online is when they come into your store, in a physical store, you can look them in the face and you can get a read on them. Mm-hmm. But when you're selling online, there's no chance of that. People just leave their shopping cart, abandon it. Mm-hmm. I think the latest stats where it's, you know, shopping cart abandonment, it's like 70 or 80% exactly. easily, you know, industry-wide. And, you know, people just leave stuff they and for any number of reasons and you have no idea. Mm-hmm. So the only thing you can do is try and build really great, well, one of the things you can do is build really great logging into your system so you can at least see the path they've taken and identify if there's any patterns there. Um, so one of the challenges we have is with the uh, um, abandonment during the setup process. So we're trying to figure out different ways that we can get them to to continue on with the process because mm-hmm. there is a stage in there where we at least have to grab, grab their name mm-hmm. and they have to sign off on a privacy and uh, terms of use sort of checkbox mm. and so we're we're trying to figure out okay how do, when they get there a lot of people look at it and go okay i don't want to be there yeah and i don't want to do this anymore but we haven't quite figured out is it because they don't want to say yes to the checkbox and put in their name or is it because they don't know why they want to do video chat yet mm. So we're trying, we're, we're playing with those different ideas and saying, okay, what can we put on the screen there so that they look at it and go, yes, I do want to continue to the next step. How long, how long is the terms of use and is that fully visible to them at that point in time? They, no, they don't have to read it. They just have to, yeah. to ch- check a box mm-hmm. um, that says that they agree to it and the terms of use and privacy policy are hyperlinked from that. Yeah, yeah. So there's no, you know, there's no long... Uh, document they have to scroll through or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I believe that um, a big the challenge is that they don't consumers don't understand what value they're getting by seeing video. Because mm-hmm. um, like anything, if you've never used it before, it's hard for you to imagine mm-hmm. the value you're going to get from it. And if they go in, if we if we compare it to their alternative, if they actually go into the store. Um, they could spend three hours browsing around the store, you know, and, and the salesperson is not going to ask them to sign any kind of terms of use or, or agreement, right? So that's the other challenge is this is a, a unique artifact to the, like you say, this new channel, right? Yep. Um, yeah. And, and you're right about the video thing, too. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of preconceptions about what the video chat is going to be. And if yeah. they've never done it before, I mean, they certainly could have that that question in their head. What are they going to ask of me on this? Maybe I don't want to talk to somebody. Yeah. So we're experimenting with some different um, techniques to try and mm-hmm. make it as seamless and as barrier free as possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So, so just to recap, so the the it's full audio video being transmitted from the retail site to the end customer at home in their pajamas, but all but the, the all that's being transmitted from the end customer in their pajamas is their voice or is their or voice, and text? they can optionally turn on their video later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got got it. Uh, interesting. Interesting. And in your uh, just kind of follow up question on that so in your uh research have you because a lot of things a lot of times what i do as a product manager is i might look for um similar problems that have already been addressed let's say in other industries right so not necessarily competitors but you know okay if i'm in if i'm in retail i might look and say well have they solved this problem in manufacturing so have you seen any different like a different domain maybe it's not buying things uh online but but maybe other examples where they've cracked some of these nuts or or still too new you know certainly there's lots of elements of that we've integrated into the the current iterations of the product yeah um so we're constantly doing that looking at other sort of derivative well not derivative i would say but similar uh, yeah adjacent type markets and products Mm -hmm. um we take a lot of cues from live text chat as an industry because they they have a lot of this um 
also there was a lot of resistance to live text chat when it was first coming out and people doing, oh, I don't know if I want a live text chat. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so we definitely do that. Um, the, there's a couple things that really stand out for me that, that, that I, that, uh, my experience shows with this one is that you want to transition from intuitive gut feeling type decisions to data driven decisions here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Whatever you may think is a good experiment, but you got to prove it out with data, mm-hmm. uh, because there's a lot of lot of. It, it just you have the data, you should use it. The data tells you who's using it and why they're using it, right? Mm-hmm. So even you can go to these other industries and look for ideas, mm-hmm. um, um, but again, it's all got to be proven out. So develop a really quick and efficient way to experiment on something, analyze those results, implement changes. This is a, a lean startup, Eric Ries sort of, um, you know, one-on-one type of thing, right? Mm-hmm. You want to, uh, you know, experiment on that, build it, test it, you know, think about it again, mm-hmm. rerun another test, and on and on and on. So it's a continuous improvement type of thing. Yeah, iterate, iterate, iterate. Yeah. yeah, and we've been iterating with with messaging, with uh, you know, colors, with images, with mm-hmm. everything we can. We're doing A/B testing on it to try and see what converts better, what doesn't, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool, cool. So, so um, just to give a better uh, kind of visual, so, so if we were to take, a, let's say, if we were to take a, a, a product page um, online um, from um, what, what would what would be a good what would be a good one um, like a I don't know, like a Leon's furniture store or something like that. Sure. Um, how big how big is this button of yours as compared to whatever the cust- whatever your customer has traditionally there so let's say there's there's a picture that's let's say two inches by two inches of a of a dining room set um i mean i'm assuming from what you're describing that stays there but then you just put beside it this this button that says yeah we have know, an automated popover so okay. it's like a sliding a rectangle that comes okay. up from the bottom right of the corner that slides up Got it. and that that slides up automatically if somebody's been on a certain page for a certain amount of time there's other different things for it mm-hmm. um, but it's always accessible through a, a minimized bar in the bottom right as well Got it. Um, so it's not you know th- this is another thing too is that there's a there's a trend right now happening on websites where there's a lot of s- popovers that are centered in the page yeah, exactly. you get this on a lot of blogs yeah sign like up that. for the newsletter and and they make the x to make it go away really really fine and and hard to see so you almost yeah. feel like you have to fill out your name to get rid of that uh, box yeah and yep. and so the, i mean there's a reason why people do it is because it does work uh you know but uh when you're dealing with a retailer that has a brand um there's a there's a certain trade-off you always have to make how intrusive is the element that you're putting on the screen? If you're hiding stuff and being a little bit coy about it, what does that say about your brand and the experience that you're trying to have? And I think it's kind of, it's contrary to the, the online shopping experience. The online shopping world is hyper competitive and you have a lot of people browsing online for products and searching and you mess up once in that process with them and they're going to just go to the competitor's site and that competitor's site is not you know, a 15 minute drive away, it's a five second click away. Yep. So, you know, playing fast and loose with that stuff is, is risky. Mm-hmm. So you got to, you got to be careful about it and make sure that the, uh, you know, the trade off is there. Mm-hmm. So we, we do something that's a little more subdued than a center popover. Um, but it's smart about when it comes up and when it's shown. So we try and get people at those trigger points. So for example, if you're on a product page for a long time, and you're looking at a specific product, that mm-hmm. might be the time where you want to get help. So that's the time where we, where we might be a little more intrusive because we believe that's when you want to see it, mm-hmm. right? Whereas other pages, we might not be intrusive at all of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's good. But you're, of course, you're competing on that website with everything else. Yeah. So it's it's always uh, it's hard. You know, websites now have so much stuff on them, so many different features and functions and so forth. I mean, mm-hmm. just go to Amazon's website, and they're they're a leader in this. And they first when they first started, you know, the the types of features they had on their website, all the different recommendations. I, I remember the reviews when people mm-hmm. would go through it and they would look at it and they'd go, Oh, there's too much stuff on this Amazon site. Yeah. 
but they drive their stuff through metrics and they know exactly why they have that certain you know scrolling bar of you know related products at the bottom they know how much revenue that drives for them they know that people some mm-hmm. people appreciate that and they've done a really amazing job at at putting all that stuff together in an online environment that converts mm. cool cool well listen i want to respect your time eli so let's uh let's let's move along to our next one here so um so let's say we check, you and I are going to check in in another three months, another another quarter. So we're currently uh, March here. So let's say, uh, you know, April, May, let's say end of June, you know, we sit down together to have a conversation. What uh, can you throw out a couple uh, current goals or metrics that uh, you'd be willing to, uh, you know, uh, share and, and, and we'll play the little game again to see, uh, see how sure. well you do? Well, this one will be harder. And I think it's the only one that really matters for us right now, which is customers. Okay. So we want to bring on, um, you know, in the next quarter, we want to bring on five new customers. Okay. Okay. And that's, um, if we, we believe that we get, get five, six or seven customers, we're going to have enough information that we're going to be able to, uh, you know, go to the next level with the company. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the goal. So five in the next quarter. Okay. Okay. Wow. You're right. We don't need much more to talk about. That sounds like, uh, uh, what, about, right? what, what they call them a, B, uh, a big hairy audacious goal that sounds like a bhag for sure yeah yeah, yeah. um that's uh, that that's great now um are you comfortable saying uh like are, are two of those already in the pipe or or are we talking about five from a from a standstill or I'm, or you'd rather not say well, the sales cycle we finding is finding is longer than we would like so yeah. uh, there'll, be some, there'll be some that'll be from the pipe and i'm sure some that won't be oh, oh, oh. um I don't have five that are going to convert next week, so it's it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool, good. Well, um, I know uh, I know I've been trying to uh, uh, comb through my uh, my contact list, and anybody that uh, you know that that I think can help you out, I'll uh, you know I'll get those over to you. And oh, thank you. Um, you know, if our if our listeners. Uh, uh, have any friends or family in the business uh, that think might be interested in this kind of technology? Um, you know, uh, hopefully they can uh, they can reach out to you as well, which gets um, segues us nicely to the next piece. So let's say we've got somebody uh, listening here, and it's probably going to be somebody you know of the entrepreneurial vein like yourself, Eli, that says, "Oh wow, you know, uh, you know, maybe they're thinking I'm doing what Eli's doing, but it sounds like he's three steps ahead of me." Any uh, contact information that you're comfortable uh, sharing with the audience if they sure. if they want to reach out to you and maybe follow up on some of these topics? Absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, the, the company website is www.storehome.co, um, and my personal website personal sorry email is eli at storehome.co, and that's .co not .com. So storehome.co. Yeah. So feel free if anybody wants to reach out. I'm happy to to talk and certainly if you have know somebody that's interested in this kind of new and innovative way of uh, selling to consumers mm-hmm. i'd love to talk to them yeah so just before we leave let's reiterate then your your target so uh, i recall you saying that um you're not going after the national re- the national uh, uh brands here you're looking at uh, uh retailers with two to three stores uh max um, and uh, uh, typically selling um, items or packages of items that are in the uh, high thousands, ten, ten, ten thousand. Like, is there a is there a sales value aspect to to the item that you th- uh, do you think? Or the, I or think no? the value is secondary to okay. to the product itself. The, I think the, what, the size of the store is the main. Um, well, more more so um, the the type of product. Okay. Um, if you're if okay. you're selling a a product that is complex to buy lots of features lots of options bought infrequently by your consumers yep. um and something that uh you know ends up having usually a higher ticket price associated with you mm-hmm. because of the complexity of it and the value it provides to the consumer uh, this product is really great for for you to especially develop those relationships with online shoppers very quickly so you're developing a real personalized relationship okay. with the online shopper um at the very minimum it almost always leads to them coming into your store um and, and in the best case scenarios especially in distress sales or time pertinent sales um you, they'll actually you know give you their credit card information right there over the video chat mm-hmm. so it's it's a really good thing okay. so anything in those areas i mean the 
the number of stores is a rough guide that we okay. use. Um, certainly, if somebody is interested who has you know a dozen stores or whatnot, the product's certainly capable of dealing with all that. Mm-hmm. Um, so any size is right if you're interested. Yeah, yeah, cool, good. Good. Well, uh, Eli, on behalf of Ready Product uh, Radio and our listeners, uh, let me thank you again for uh, for having this uh, chat um, and uh, welcoming, me, welcoming me into your uh, home office here uh, in lovely uh, Oakville. So uh, we'll uh, we'll set a, a rough calendar for sometime end, end of June and check in with you again. And uh, hopefully instead of five new customers, maybe you've got uh, seven or eight. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Okay, thanks, Eli. Thank you, Alan. All right, take care. Today's podcast was brought to you by Under 10 Consulting. Get your product teams up to speed quickly with the latest methods and a proven process tailored to your organization. Thank you for listening to this episode of Ready Product Radio, part of the Ready PDM Network. This is when most podcasters ask you to leave a review on iTunes if you like the show. My only request is if you found the show entertaining, inspiring, or informative, please share it with a colleague or friend who may feel the same way. Also, note that the views expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect my views or the views of the Ready PDM network. If you want yourself or your product to be ready, then keep your eyes on your markets, your ears to your customers, your mind on their experiences, both good and bad, and finally, keep your hearts in your products. Until next time, thank you for listening. You can contact us on Twitter at Ready Product Radio. That's R-D-Y-P-R-O-D-U-C-T-R-A-D-I-O. And on the web at www.readyproductradio.com. Dude, mate, what do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.